I'd like to welcome you all here for the uh, weekly, or mostly weekly, uh, Center for Evolution and Medicine uh, talk. And today I'm really pleased to welcome Tina Warner. She is in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Oklahoma. She's also an adjunct professor in periodontics, periodontics and she's also the presidential research professor of the A, A, A presidential research professor. Um, she attended uh, Harvard for graduate school. University of Kansas. Uh, she was at the University of Kansas undergrad. Uh, and then went to Harvard for graduate school, uh, where she got interested in ancient DNA and leaning her head against the wall to get data. Um, <laughs> she then did a postdoc at um, the University of Zurich with Frank Rulli. And we are very thrilled to have her here today to tell us about her late Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much, Anna. Thank you all for having me here. It's really a pleasure to come and talk to you and um, share some of the research that I've been doing over the past four years. Um, I've moved since I finished my PhD into more into working on ancient microbes and looking at evolutionary ecology of our microbiome. And I know uh, looking at um, your website, you are a very diverse group of researchers and scholars. And so in thinking about this talk, um, I'm going to start with just kind of a background in general about the microbiome, just to bring everybody onto the same page. And then I'll move into some of the specific research questions that, that I've been addressing. And so just to begin, um, this may look like a photograph of outer space, but these individual pinpoints of light are not stars. They're in fact individual genomes of bacteria that have been stained with DAPI to glow under fluorescent light. And this is taken from the surface of teeth, human teeth, your teeth. And it's been a few hours since breakfast and since you brushed your teeth, and this is probably about what your teeth look like right now. <laughs> So the human body contains an estimated 10 trillion human cells and 100 trillion bacterial cells. And so if you add these two numbers together, you'll find that we are actually 90% bacterial. Now, 100 trillion bacterial cells, that is an incredible number. And in fact, if you were to take each one of those cells from a single human body and just line them up end to end, now they're each about one micron long or about one millionth of a meter. And if you were to line them up end to end, they would actually wrap around the Earth twice. It just gives you a sense of the scale of the magnitude of this number. Now, 100 trillion bacterial cells, that is truly an astronomical number, but even that fails to capture the immensity of that number because there are only about 300 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. So the number of bacteria in and on the human body actually exceeds the number of stars in more than 300 galaxies. So at this point, you may be wondering how we appear human at all. And the answer is that while numerous, these bacteria are also incredibly small. On average, they're about a thousand times smaller than a single human cell. And so when you collectively add them all together, they weigh about 1.5 kilograms or roughly three pounds. And that is about the same weight as your brain and your liver. And in fact, there are a number of people who have argued that we should really think of the microbiome as an additional organ system. Now, most of these bacteria reside in the gut. They live in particular body habitats, and by far the gut, and especially the distal colon, is where most of them reside. Um, and there they play a very important role in digestion, particularly of fiber. And they're so numerous in the gut that um, that stool actually has a bacterial density of about a, um, about a hundred billion cells per gram. And that is why when you use the toilet, you actually lose about 9 to 13% of your total body cells. Um, the, the variation here really depends on the amount of, of, of uh, complex plant matter in your diet. Vegetarians and vegans tend to lose a little bit more than people who have a higher uh, meat content. Um, but in addition to the gut, another really important body site for the microbiome is the oral microbiome. And, and there they inhabit a variety of surfaces. You have about 100 milligrams in your mouth at any given time. They live on the surface of the tongue, the buccal mucosa, and the surfaces of the teeth. And the oral microbiome actually play, has a really special role in the history of microbiology. 
because um, it is there that we have the first undisputed description of bacteria written in a letter by Antony van Leeuwenhoek about 300 years ago to the Royal Society of London. And there he described very many small living animals which move themselves very extravagantly within his own dental plaque. And he tried to count them in vain. He said that the number of these animals in the scurf of man's teeth are so many that I believe they exceed the number of men in a kingdom. Now, if anything, we now know this is a gross understatement because we have nearly as many bacteria on the surface of our teeth as there are humans on Earth, and every day each of us swallows an average of 80 billion bacteria in our saliva. Now, it's not all just about cell counts. These microorganisms also contain an immense diversity of genes, and the function of these genes far exceed the capacity of our own genome. So the genes of the human microbiome outnumber our own by an estimated 150 to 1, and this collective bacterial genome in our bodies is so large that it's often referred to as an accessory genome. And in fact, we require these bacteria and their genes to perform even the most basic human life functions. And this has led some to describe this relationship between humans and their microbes as that of a superorganism, like a colony of bees, or as a hollow beyond, like the tight ecosystem that we find within coral. So rather than a leaf on the great tree of life, we are in some ways more like a tree house, a home woven from many branches um, with both permanent and transient microbial inhabitants. And yet we have only very recently come to even notice the large number of underexplored and mostly nameless microorganisms inhabiting the human body. In fact, it was only in 2001 that molecular biologist Joshua Lederberg coined the term microbiome to, quote, signify the ecological community of commensal, symbiotic, and pathogenic microorganisms that literally share our body space and have been all but ignored as determinants of health and disease. And so although we have made great strides in revealing the diversity, the variation, and the evolution of the human <laughs> genome, we know surprisingly little about the origins and evolution of the microbial portion of ourselves, our microbiome. And this is rather remarkable because these communities perform major and essential functions within their host bodies. And I'm just going to highlight a few of them. Um, first of all, the, the microbiome plays a major role di in digestion. I think most of us know that. And if we look at um, other, uh, other animals, we can see this um, in, in, in high relief. So for example, you take cattle and horses, they subsist almost entirely on grass and cellulose-rich plants. They actually cannot digest these materials by themselves. All animals lack the genes that encode cellulases, which are required to break those beta-glycosidic bonds between the glucose molecules within cellulose, and instead they have evolved these highly symbiotic relationships with gut bacteria that break down the cellulose for them, producing short-chain fatty acids as a byproduct, which is actually what they absorb. Now, in the case of cattle and horses, they've evolved different strategies for doing this. In the case of cattle, they have foregut fermentation, they have a massive rumen where they digest um, the, the grass, and of course in horses they have hindgut fermentation, they have a greatly expanded cecum, different strategies but both of them utilize the activity of bacteria in digestion. Probably the most extreme example of this in the animal kingdom is that of uh, koalas. So as you know, koalas eat eucalyptus. Not everyone knows, however, that eucalyptus is incredibly toxic. There are not many animals that can eat eucalyptus, and that's why koalas are such specialists here. Um, eucalyptus contains many, many toxins, and they actually have a highly specialized gut microbiome that allows them to detoxify this material. Now, acquiring this gut microbiome that can break down this very toxic eucalyptus is so critical that during the process of weaning, a koala joey actually, once they transition away from milk, will spend two to three weeks eating something called pap, which is a specialized type of feces produced by the mother. They have to do this for several weeks before they're able to consume eucalyptus um, effectively. Now, when humans were just starting to explore the role of digestion and the role of these gut microbes in assisting with digestion, but we can already see some patterns. This is some data that's about to be published from a study I'm involved in. It's going to come out um, in about three weeks in Nature Communications. And what we did is we looked at the gut microbiomes of individuals living um, uh, hunter-gatherer lifestyles 
rural agricultural lifestyles, food producers, and urban industrial uh, populations. And what we see is that we have a high amount of bacterial diversity in both hunter-gatherers and rural agriculturalists, and this really drops off in urban industrial environments. So urban industrial lifestyles, we see a dramatic decline in bacterial diversity. And that's true both in terms of the number of different species and also, also how different those species are from each other. One thing that's quite interesting, of course, is that when we look at some clinical phenotypes like obesity, we see a further reduction of diversity, and you see this reduction of diversity as you increase pathologies of the colon. There's something very special about having a high diversity of bacteria in the, micro, in the gut microbiome that seems to be associated with health and resiliency, and this is a completely new area that we're hoping to explore. Now, many of you might be familiar with some of the really exciting mouse studies that have taken place where they've shown that there is this feedback mechanism between the host and its microbiome. So not only does your diet affect the microbiome that you have, but the microbiome that you have affects your own biology. And so this has been shown really well in mice where they took lean mice and obese mice and they took the, micro the microbes out of, out of each of them. They sterilized their gut and they swapped them and they were able to swap the phenotypes of those mice simply by changing the consortia back bacteria living in their gut. Uh, the microbiome also plays major roles in vitamin production and drug metabolism. So the gut microbiome is a major source of uh, vitamin K, um, it's the primary source of vitamin K, but it also produces a number of B vitamins, including folate, biotin, and others. Um, and the gut also, the gut microbiome plays a major role in metabolism of drugs. So many drugs that are taken orally are only effective if they've been metab or only absorbable if they've been metabolized first by bacteria. And this is probably probably most well known in the case of oral contraceptives. Uh, obviously there's a warning label on them saying um, that they're not effective if you take antibiotics and that's because it actually, these, uh, these oral contraceptives actually require bacterial metabolism um, in order to be absorbable. All right, um, the microbiome also plays a major role in immunity, in establishing immunity. Um, this is a very active area of research. There's some excellent research going on here, but it seems like the first three years of life are critical for the establishment of the immune system and establishing stability and reactivity of the immune system. There's a lot of great work by Martin Blazer looking at early childhood antibiotic prescription, gut microbiome disruption, and long-term um, immune dysfunction, especially relating to things like allergies, eczema, and asthma. Um, in the gut, um, one direct way in which uh, inflammation, um, uh, immune dysregulation works is uh, when you have dietary fiber, you have bacteria in the gut that digest that fiber. They produce as byproducts short-chain fatty acids. One of those is called butyrate. Butyrate is the primary nutrient for colonic cells. Um, if you have sufficient butyrate production, you have healthy colonic cell growth. Um, if, you have def if you're deficient in butyrate, you tend to see atrophy and you have greater amounts of inflammation. Um, inflammation and immune dysregulation plays a major role, obviously, also in periodontal disease, in the oral cavity, and we see systemic inflammation drives um, the progression of periodontal disease and the overgrowth of unhealthy communities of bacteria. And last, uh, the microbiome plays a big role in defense against pathogens. And this happens in many different ways, by outcompeting uh, foreign bacteria, um, but also by creating, uh, through niche construction, their own uh, environment that favors themselves. This is seen most um, apparently in the vaginal microbiome, where you have native populations of lactobacilli. Bacilli. They, they create a highly acidic environment that selects for themselves. And many pathogenic organisms cannot survive in such an acidic environment, and it reduces um, um, pathogen and STD transmission. But of course the microbiome can also be a source of infection and a source of problems. In their own native body habitats, these uh, microbes are highly adapted and largely commensal, but if they're transferred to a different body site, they can cause problems. We are starting to realize this is a, there's a major connection between periodontal disease and gingivitis and conditions like atherosclerosis and endocarditis, where recently um, many of these plaque deposits that are formed within um, these vascular tissues have been tested using PCR and found to be positive for oral bacteria. These transient bacteremias that are caused by gingivitis and periodontal disease um, seem to transfer these dental black bacteria into cardiovascular, the cardiovascular system, where sometimes they in invade local epithelia or begin to produce plaques, which serve as the starting points for ather atherosclerosis and endocarditis. All right, 
So it's clear that the microbiome plays a pivotal role in human biology, host development and immunity, digestion, and a range of acute and chronic inflammatory diseases. And therefore, it is critical to understand its evolution and changing ecology through time. So ancient DNA studies um, have long focused on the analysis of bone and dentin. And we've made major advancements in recovering host and pathogen DNA from these tissues. And in the past decade, it has even become possible to reconstruct the uh, entire genome of uh, extinct animals, ancient humans, and specific human and plant pathogens. But historically, accessing ancient microbiomes has been very challenging. So the human body, as you know, decomposes rapidly after death. Um, in exceptional cases, mummification may occur, but more typically, we are left only with a skeleton. And this is where the story would end. The skeleton has no inherent microbiome. And so um, many people have been trying to puzzle out, well, how could we access um, the human microbiome in other ways? Well, it turns out that under uh, extremely dry or frozen conditions, the gastrointestinal contents and feces can desiccate to produce coprolites. And that is a long-term record of the gut microbiome. And more routinely, um, dental plaque of the oral microbiome will actually calcify in situ in your mouth and persist after death in a, in a mineralized state. And so thus, through these two uh, substrates, um, it becomes possible to access the ancient hu human microbiome and, and at least to study these two microbiomes, which are the most diverse and perhaps the most important microbiomes um, of the human body, and to extend this research of the human microbiome into our evolutionary past. And so for the past four years, um, as I said before, I've kind of transitioned my research into studying ancient microbiomes and studying the evolution of the microbiome. I've done this in a number of ways um, by studying extant populations and now starting to work with some non-human primates. But today, I'm really going to focus on the work that I've done on ancient uh, microbiomes. And we published a number of articles. Um, we published four this year. We have another one coming out in a couple months. And there's more on the way. So this is a really exciting and expanding area of research. And in this talk, I'm going to share with you some of these recent advances that we've made in reconstructing our ancient microbial self. So I'm going to begin with coprolites. Um, in case you don't know what they look like, most people don't, this is what fossilized human feces or semi-fossilized human feces looks like. Um, it's diverse, as you can see. There are different colors. There are different textures. Um, very often, we see um, preserved plant remains inside. Um, this is a whole seed. Um, this person was apparently eating sticks. Um, we see a wide diversity. One thing that's very clear is that people ate much more fibrous diets, typically, in the past. And um, some of this work was started before I joined um, my team in the University of Oklahoma. I'm going to present some of their work and then show you how I'm carrying it forward. Um, this was an early study on trying to characterize some of these gut microbiomes and just try to see they preserve macroscopically. But, but what's going on at the microscopic and really importantly, the biomolecular level? Do they actually preserve? And so um, my research team had looked at um, a couple of famous copper light samples, one from the Trillian Iceman, Utzi, um, and another one from a 1918 soldier glacier mummy. Now, this is like the optimal case. Both of these individuals died in the Alps. They were frozen. They basically were freeze dried in the high altitude and then preserved um, in the case of, let's see, over thousands of years, in the case of the soldier mummy, only for about a little less than a century. And what we find is we can use this tool it's developed by Dan Knight's called Source Tracker. It uses um, Bayesian probability to what you can do is you can say, OK, I have a series of uh, genetic data I've developed, I've generated from certain sources. So for example, from the primate gut or from the rural human gut or the urban human gut or the oral microbiome. And then you can take the community of bacteria that you can reconstruct from a, a coprolite and you can compare them and it uses Bayesian statistics to try to assign what proportion of the bacteria that we find in here sources to one of these original sources. And it's a great way of kind of estimating the preservation. And what we find is in these really excellently preserved frozen mummies, we see a large proportion of the bacteria inside maps to something like the primate gut or the rural human gut. This unknown category doesn't actually mean that it's unknown. It, means, it also means that it's ambiguous. I mean, it can't be assigned with high confidence. So we see a large amount of the bacteria in these really well-preserved coprolites mapping to, um, to a, a human or primate gut. And they had also looked at a sample from Rio Zape, Mexico. Um, this is a cave site. It's a dry cave. It's extremely desiccated and was capped with adobe, so it was absolutely um, uh, 
in situ and in an ideal situation from a non-glacial environment. And again, we find here a really high proportion is mapping to the gut. And this was really exciting and we jumped forward and analyzed a bunch more samples. But what we found is actually these are rather rare. Coprolites do not typically preserve well at the biomolecular level, especially as you move into other, um, other tissues. So this is from a, a mummy. This is in, uh, mummified gastrointestinal contents. We thought this would be perfect. It turns out that if you actually analyze the bacterial communities here, it really just looks like garden compost. And this makes sense because, the, as I said before, fecal bacteria exist at an extremely high density within fecal matter. It's very bioactive and they usually just auto-digest. They usually just uh, the proportions of bacteria completely change, even if you don't have um, exogenous bacteria coming in. We analyzed another one from Heinz Cave. This is a very famous site, um, early site of uh, uh, human migration into the Americas. Um, again, most of it we can't identify at all or source at all. The very little that we can really just looks like garden compost. So the unfortunate thing about coprolites is that the vast majority of them do not preserve well. Um, we have a few that are really good. They're always rare, and so it's a little bit difficult to develop much research on the gut microbiome from them um, for this reason. However, we've been thinking about, well, what are the sort of preservational contexts that might um, preserve the gut microbiome better? And one thing we've noticed is that it's really removing or immobilizing that water that seems to be extremely important. And so we've started looking not just at any coprolite, um, but focusing on ones that come from salt mines. And here we're finding much better results. So I'm just going to show you a couple I've been working on. This is an Austrian coprolite. It's from the site of Hallstatt in Austria. It's fantastic. You can go to the salt mine. You can ride the slide down. It's now a tourist uh, location. You can actually see they've reconstructed what Iron Age salt mining would have looked like. Um, it's great. And of course, they have latrines there and um, because the salt miners needed latrines. And so we are able to pull out um, coprolites from that environment. And I'm also working with some samples that come from the Cherubod salt mines in Iran. This is a very ancient salt mine. It's been mined for a very long time. It's still mined today. But there were a series of earthquakes in the Iron Age that collapsed the mine and trapped the miners exactly where they were. Because of the extremely high salt content, they were desiccated extremely quickly. And we have this amazing preservation of the coprolites here. Now, if we apply source tracker to these, we see um, that at the molecular level, they also have a, a really good preservation. So in the case of the Austrian sample, we have more than 90% of the bacteria that we pull out of here really match a strongly gut microbiome profile. And from the um, Iron Age one, we have about 65%. This is excellent. We can really do something with this. And so we're following up and looking for more salt mine samples. Uh, if we take a closer look and say, well, not just the community, but who's actually there. If any of you are familiar with gut microbiome research, I call this the A-list. These are some of the really abundant things we find inside. This just looks like a modern gut. It doesn't look any different. It's extremely similar. So we have things like Ruminococcus and Prevotella and Clostridium, Fecalibacterium and Coprococcus, Blaudia. These are really the A-list bacteria that you find in, in the modern gut. But we found a couple things that were really interesting to us. One was Bifidobacterium. Bifidobacterium likes um, milk. It's especially common in infant guts. And in populations that don't drink milk, it typically, typically starts to decline by about age seven, and then is only sporadically found in adults after that. What we found is that the Iron Age Iran sample, we did not find Bifidobacterium in it, but we did find it in the Austrian sample. That makes a lot of sense because this is a dairying population. We also found another one that really intrigued us. <clears throat> this is Treponema. Treponema is fascinating because for a long time it was thought not to be a part of the human gut at all. And we found it in both of our samples. What's interesting is if you actually go out and look and say, well, where else do we find gut treponemes? Um, you find them in termite guts, you find them in pig guts, you find them in uh, the great apes. Um, in our work and other work, we're finding them in human hunter-gatherers. We actually find them in rural human agriculturalists. Um, uh, this is in uh, Malawi and in our work in the Peruvian highlands. But what's really interesting is you do not find them in urban populations in the US or in Europe. There, they are just gone. And we've looked at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gut microbiome pro profiles, and they are simply not there. So one of the questions we have is, what has systematically eliminated treponema from the urban gut when it is so widespread in our ancestors and in living people today with more traditional lifestyles? Why have we lost this component of the ancestral human gut microbiome? <coughs> So I'm going to transition now and talk a little bit about my work in the oral microbiome. Um, just to orient you, a lot of what I'm going to talk about comes from a series of samples from medieval Germany, from a site of Dahlheim. It's from a little cemetery here, um, a couple different locations. 
Um, just to show you what calculus looks like, you might not um, know, this is what dental calculus looks like. In a living person, it looks like this. This is my motivational slide for going to the dentist. Um, we're going to focus on this tooth right here, and I'm just going to show you some backscattered SEM. So this is it in profile. We're going to take a look there at this part of the tooth. That's the calculus deposit. We're going to zoom in and again take another look at that calculus deposit. This is what it looks like. Now, as I mentioned before, what's really exciting about calculus, what really gets me excited about it, is it's actually the only part of the human body that fossilizes while you're still alive. And that's part of the reason why it is so well preserved. And we do not see many of the post-mortem alterations that we do see in coprolites. We don't see them in calculus, and I'll explain that as we go along. Another thing that you'll notice right away, which is very exciting about calculus, is that it's laminated. It has an accretion structure. It actually looks like an onion. You can actually see these layers where the mineralogy kind of changes. And that's because the way it, it forms incrementally during life, you have a, a plaque deposit that forms. There is something that initiates a calcification event from uh, calcium phosphate in your saliva. It, calcifies rapidly, probably on a very short time scale, maybe on the order of two weeks, and then you get a new biofilm that forms on top, a new plaque deposit, and this just repeats over and over again throughout your lifetime. We do not know the periodicity. Um, you might be surprised to learn that dentists have had no interest in studying this, so there's almost no work on this whatsoever, and we're starting this now. But in many people um, who don't brush their teeth at all, like this um, woman from medieval Germany, we have many, many, many layers. And what's exciting about this is that if you look at dental development, your story really ends at adulthood, because the teeth don't develop any further after that. And so we. We don't have a good way of getting at life history information from adults because many things that we can look at remodel or change through time. What's exciting about calculus is it does not remodel. It grows appositionally in these incremental layers. And so here we have a record. Calculus formation really begins in the early 20s. You don't, you don't usually see it before then. And then just proceeds until death. And so here we have a layered record of this individual's life, temporally ordered. Now we don't know what amount of time this represents or this represents, but we know that this came before this. And so theoretically, if we could develop the tools, we could go in and um, mine out information from different discrete periods of this individual's lifetime. Um, you might have noticed, actually, in the last slide, um, there's a little bit of discolored material on the outside. That's what soil looks like. Um, this is calculus, and this is just a little bit of soil on the outside. We didn't clean these before we um, analyze them, and we can confirm that because we can use something like EDS where we can analyze the elemental composition here, and we've just uh, colored uh, the calcium in red and silicon, which is a great proxy for soil and green, and you can see the soil is really just limited to this outer surface where it fills in some minor cracks on the surface, but it does not penetrate into the calculus. You'll notice there's a little green dot there. That's actually a little bit of biogenic silica. It might be a fragment of a phytolith or a diatome. It's broken. Um, it was broken during sectioning, so we can't exactly tell. That's what um, uh, like a little bit of biogenic silica looks like, and it was probably incorporated during, <coughs> during life, um, probably through food or water. Um, we can also decalcify this material, and this is really exciting. So if you decalcify this material and gram stain it, gram stains beautifully, the cells actually stay intact, which I was shocked at uh, initially. But this is what it looks like under a microscope under gram stain. Um, going back to the BSE, you can see individual cells um, just fossilized, just mineralized right in place within that um, dental calculus matrix. We see different um, morphologies. We see bacilli. We see cocci. We see filaments in other locations. And they're all just mineralized in place within this calcium phosphate uh, matrix. It's actually the same calcium phosphate that makes up your dentin and your bones. Um, it's super saturated in your saliva and it just precipitates right into the calculus. But the thing that really makes dental calculus extraordinary from my perspective is, um, is its DNA preservation. So just to put this in context, if you look at bones and teeth, which is what we usually focus on, bones and dentin, um, in bone, the cell count is extremely low. So you get about 1,000 cells per milligram. That's average. It varies a little bit over your lifetime, but about 1,000 cells per milligram. From ancient material, we typically are able to achieve maybe one nanogram of DNA per milligram. We really get very little DNA out when we try to extract it. And of that small amount of DNA that we can pull out of bone, it has a very high proportion of it is going to be soil contamination, usually as much as 99% or more. And so 
we've taken, just to kind of demonstrate this, I've taken samples of teeth from around the world just to kind of show you some geographic and temporal diversity here. And we extracted DNA from the dentin and we looked at, well, what proportion of that dentin, uh, of the DNA from the dentin, is human or something else? Now, at the time of life, 100% should be human. These are sterile tissues. There should be nothing else there. It should be 100% human. But what we find from these samples from diverse locations is that it quickly gets replaced with our overwhelmed, really, with environmental bacteria. Area. So we see on average between 0.1% and in a really good case, this is from the high Himalayas in a, in a dry cave, we see as much as 8% human DNA. There are some extraordinary cases where it's higher than that, but in general, we see very low amounts of human DNA. Now contrast that with calculus, this is really interesting. So dental calculus or dental plaque, which is what, it, what it's made of, starts out with a cell density of over 200 million cells per milligram. This is an incredibly cell dense substrate. Um, from ancient dental calculus, I've pulled out as much as 500 nanograms of DNA per milligram of, of calculus. That is the same amount of DNA you will get from fresh human liver, just to put that in perspective. And what's really exciting is that we see a very low burden of soil contamination. So just returning to those same teeth, if we instead analyze calculus and we ask, well, what proportion of it is oral bacteria versus something else, about 60 to 80 percent of the DNA that we pull out is oral bacteria. It may actually be higher. Some of the uh, taxa um, are actually occur in multiple environments, and I just went ahead and threw them in the other category to be safe. So it might actually be even higher than this. Um, and what's also, as I mentioned before, so exciting is just the amount of DNA that's preserved. So here what I've done is I've just plotted the the amounts of DNA we've recovered from calculus and dentin from the same teeth, from paired samples. Um, this is from a modern tooth. I don't have dentin. The lady wanted to keep her teeth, so I only got her calculus. Um, that's a joke. She was, she was just having a dental cleaning, not an extraction. So I just have calculus from her. So she's got a, almost about 100 nanograms of DNA per milligram. From my four archaeological samples, I range from about 450, I think this one was, down to around eight or nine. Um, nanograms of DNA per milligram. Dentin from the same teeth has very, very low amounts. This is a logarithmic scale, and we're less than one nanogram per milligram for all of them. Now I wondered also, well, what if we took a diseased tooth? Because we find plenty of examples of carious lesions and abscesses in the, in the archaeological record. So we took a tooth that had a very large cavity and a huge dental abscess. You really can't appreciate it here, but that whole area inside is full of reactive bone. It's an active infection. Um, and we, we looked at, well, how much DNA do we get from these as well? And you can see they fall within the range of dentin. There's, there's very, very little DNA, um, even in highly diseased bone and dentin tissue. So there's something really special about calculus. I like to use visuals and just to show you what this looks like, kind of returning to that image I began with, this is what uh, modern dental calculus looks like. If you just thin section it and you stain it with DAPI, you can see each one of these little points of light is an individual bacterial genome that's glowing back at you. This is that same image, but from ancient dental calculus. It is full, full of DNA. And this is really, really exciting. Um, going back to this question of contamination, because this becomes incredibly important to demonstrate that we aren't just looking at contamination, we did this in a number of ways. Um, first of all, one of the things you'll notice in this is that we have tremendous amount of decomposition in the tooth itself. And you can see this all this mineralogical change that's occurred. Um, if we zoom in here, you can see zones of hypo and hyper mineralization. You can see active bacterial growth. This tooth is actively being decomposed by these little bacteria that you see here. And as they grow, they secrete acid. It dissolves the mineral around them. It exposes more collagen. They're able to eat it. As they die, the minerals re-precipitate. And so you get this characteristic uh, darker and lighter shading of this change in mineralization. What they also do is when they really get going, they start just cavitating it out. So they just start eating, they, they follow the dentin tubules, and they just eat um, a lot of the collagen around it, and you get these ragged holes um, forming within the dentin. The reason for this is that when you die, basically the process of decomposition for your teeth is that you have all these teeth, uh, or all these bacteria in the environment, they start to invade the gingiva. They travel down the periodontal ligament, and we can see that. You can see all this demineralization along the cementum where the periodontal ligament was attached. It hits the root canal. It goes up into the dental pulp where it encounters an enormous amount of tissue and blood and everything else the bacteria like to eat. They have a massive population explosion. Um, they produce a lot of acid. 
that decalcifies the interior here, exposing more collagen, and they really get a huge population bloom. This slows down as those organic and easy to get nutrients decline as they use them up, and then you get a much more slower progression of decomposition after that initial boost. Now what's interesting is in calculus, we just don't see the same process. There's no dental pulp to build up that community to really give it an edge to decalcify the calculus. And so it just stays as is. We see very little evidence of any alteration. So the bacteria that we do see, because it is a calcified bacterial biofilm, are really just mineralized in place. We don't see changes in mineralogy. They're just they're just frozen right inside their, their mineral matrix. And we, we see this maintenance of this highly ordered uh, uh, calculus formation. We don't see any evidence of remodeling or, or gross uh, reorganization of the calculus. So it has a very different decomposition profile. We can take this a step further and we can take the, the bacteria out of calculus and the bacteria out of dentin and we can analyze them um, taxonomically and say, well, how similar are these communities? So what I've done here is I've just shown you the proportion of, these are just different individuals, um, multiple samples, um, the proportion of... <coughs> of different families of bacteria in calculus and dentin, and I've just given each family a unique color so that you can differentiate them. And what you can really clearly see is that the bacterial families that we find within calculus are radically different than the bacterial families that we see in dentin. They're really completely different communities. And we actually developed some new software to look at this in a more intensive way using uh, network analysis. This is work by um, Jao Rodriguez at the University of Zurich, who I worked really closely with this on. We took a number of dental calculus samples, and we took a number of dentin samples from the same teeth, so they're all paired, and then the yellow and the orange are from that diseased tooth again. And what we did is we plotted them in space in a network where distance between them um, is, uh, represents their similarity in taxonomic composition. And what you can see is the calculus all clusters together and the dentin and the carious dentin and the, and the bone abscess cluster together with a little bit more spread, which you would imagine because it's a lot of environmental bacteria. But the really exciting part, what he developed for this, was we went into the NCBI and we pulled out metagenomes that had been previously published from lots of different sources. And we pulled out every metagenome, every community of, of DNA sequences that had been uh, published for a particular site um, or particular place. And we plotted them in the graph as well as circles. Um, so you can see, well, what sorts of other metagenomes do our samples resemble? And we just color coded them. So the ones that are big red circles, those are all from human, oral, and dental studies. And you can see they cluster very, very closely with our dental calculus samples. The small red circles come from um, human, um, sorry, these are all dental plaque samples. These come from human, oral, and uh, nasopharyngeal samples, so in the nasal cavity or in the pharynx. The pink circles are studies that were, have been published for samples that come from the oral cavities and nasopharyngeal cavities of animals. And then, um, we have down here for the soil, the blue is um, samples that come from leaf litter, sediments, lakes, um, and rivers. And then the light blue um, comes from um, some additional environmental samples that are a little bit further afield. The white samples are kind of random. They're think mostly things like NASA space floor, and I didn't know how to categorize them, so I just sort of left them as white. But what you can see here is that we, we see a strong clustering of our dental calculus samples with other human oral samples, and then a progressive distance to things like uh, um, other human-associated samples and animal-associated samples, um, all associated with the oral cavity, whereas this dentin really resembles very strongly um, an environmental, a burial environment signal. So taking a step back now and not just looking at the bacteria, we can ask, well, what, what actually is in calculus? Are there other interesting things? So about 99.3% of it is bacteria. But that you would expect, it's an oral biofilm made up primarily of bacteria. Um, about 0.5% is eukarya, and that's mostly human DNA, but it does include some plant <laughs> DNA. We have a little bit of archaea, that's fun. There's one species of archaea in the mouth called Methanobrevibacter oralis, and that's what we see here. And then we see a little bit of virus, that's all bacteriophage. Um, but there's probably a lot more virus in there, but this is what we were able to identify. The, the um, database is really depopperate in, in bacteriophage sequences. We also did shotgun proteomics, and we tried to ask, well, what kinds of proteins are in here as well? And what we saw, we have a large number of bacterial proteins and also human proteins. We have a lot more human proteins than we have human DNA. We found out that this is actually mostly secretory proteins, and I'll talk about that in a minute. 
So in terms of the top taxa, we found about 2,000 species level OTUs, but the vast majority of them, more than 85%, have resolved to just 100 taxa. Some of them are really interesting. So these ones up here, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Streptococcus pyogenes, Haemophilus influenzae, Neisseria meningitidis, these are all opportunistic pathogens. Now, not every strain in this species will cause disease. In fact, we carry them asymptomatically, most of us right now, but some strains can cause disease. And we were really interested at in finding them here because it gives an evolutionary context for potentially studying these organisms in the past. The ones that we found really in high abundance, <coughs> excuse me, are these three, Porphyrmonas gingivalis, Tanarella forsythia, and Treponema denticola. These are exciting because these are major periodontal pathogens. Now perhaps it's not that surprising because we actually targeted people that had osteological evidence of periodontal disease for this study. So they had evidence of alveolar resorption and reactive inflammation at the um, alveolar margin. And we looked and we compared the frequency data we had from our shotgun data sets of these three periodontal pathogens to the human microbiome data set. This is a cohort of healthy individuals. And we found is for two of the individuals that we analyzed that both had this evidence of periodontal disease, we found that the frequency of these periodontal pathogens was much higher than what we see in the healthy cohort in the human microbiome project. So this really correlated with our expectations. For Tanarella forsythia, we actually had um, so many sequences from this organism that we were able to uh, uh, produce a, a draft genome reconstruction for it. Um, this was really exciting because it has 14 known virulence factors. We were able to identify all of them in our data. And one of them, this uh, surface protein TFSB, it's part of the S layer, it encodes part of the S layer of the bacteria, which helps it evade the immune system, was actually so abundant that we are able to recover uh, many peptides and, and almost reconstruct the full uh, protein as well. So we have here the genetic evidence for the, the, the information to encode the virulence factor, and then we actually have the virulence factor expressed as a protein as well, and that's very exciting. You might notice that we have a big gaping hole here in our genome reconstruction, and we were rather upset about this at first because we thought we'd done something wrong. But when we analyzed what we realized is this is 48,000 consecutive base pairs that encode 53 consecutive genes of a fully functional conjugative transposon carrying genes that are thought to be involved in tetracycline resistance. And we do not have that in our ancient sample. So it's in the reference genome. We do not have it. And in fact, if you take the uh, sequences on this side and the sequences on this side, you can actually overlap them. We can really prove this uh, particular strain that we have in the past does not have this conjugative transposon. Now, one of the things that I find really interesting about uh, calculus and coprolites is this extra information we get related to host and food. This is not part of the microbiome itself, but, it's, but we can learn a lot about the life histories of these individuals. So going back to the protein work, I mentioned that a lot of the proteins we find that are human are actually secretory, and they're secretory in a special way. They're mostly, they're mainly um, uh, related to the innate immune system. And this, my, this uh, proteome that we recover from ancient calculus greatly resembles what, we've, what we see in modern calculus and is very distinctive from what we find from the ancient tooth root, that dentin and cementum complex. That's mostly proteins related to structure and support, so things like uh, collagens, things related to periodontal ligament attachment, things like that. And we see a high amount of uh, innate immune proteins in calculus, both ancient and modern. Many of them are specific to neutrophils, which is a type of uh, white blood cell that's very important, especially in early reaction to bacteria. It's heavily involved in defending your uh, oral cavity from the encroachment of plaque, and they produce many, many granules full of bactericidal proteins, and that's largely what we found. So what we see here is then the proteomic evidence of a massive immune response that the body is launching against this periodontal infection that we've identified genetically and osteologically. We also find bits of food. So um, again, this is from this medieval site in Germany, this tooth here. We find little bits of connective tissue. We find phytoliths from plants. This is completely non-diagnostic. We can't really say what it is other than it is a phytolith. But we also find starch grains. This starch grain here is um, consistent. It's hard to see actually when it's projected, but it's got some features that um, are, are fairly um, diagnostic of the plant tribe Tritici, which includes things like wheat and barley. And we also have a starch granule here that's very consistent with plants within the Fabaceae or pea and bean family. 
And then genetically, we were able to pull down genetic sequences that were specific for a number of uh, what, we, what we think are dietary items. So we have uh, sheep, pig, uh, wheat, and brassica, which was probably cabbage. And so through all of this work, we have now really <laughs> demonstrated to a high degree that there's been little change in the German diet over the past <laughs> 900 years. Um, but some of the more recent work we've been doing is really exciting. Uh, following up on this work, we tried analyzing some calculus from some Vikings, and that was very exciting because one of the things we found there was milk proteins, and specifically beta-lactic globulin. Beta-lactic globulin is a protein found in um, a number of milks, although we do not produce it. We actually have mutations in the genes. So we don't express it. Uh, camels, for whatever reason, also do not. But most animals produce uh, beta-lactic globulin, especially the ruminants. They produce it in very high degree. Um, it's, it's of great interest in, um, in food science and in medicine because it is highly allerg uh, antigenic. Um, so it, for children, about 4% of children have milk allergies and it's usually to beta-lactic globulin that, that, that they have their allergy. There's a great deal of effort to try to remove it from dairy products, but it is a, an incredibly stubborn protein that's very difficult to remove. It's not um, hydrolyzed easily, it's very heat stable, and bacteria have a hard time breaking it down. That's why we think it may have survived so long in our calculus samples. Um, we analyzed calculus from different regions, from up in the north, from Britain and Scandinavia, from Central Europe, Eastern Europe, and getting into Asia, um, to see if we could find uh, milk proteins in these populations, all from the Bronze Age moving forwards, which we know were milk consuming. We also had a control population from um, Western Africa, which we, from the 19th century, that we knew was definitely not consuming milk. And we were able to identify um, a milk, this beta-lactic globulin, in a number of these individuals at a fairly high frequency. And we're really excited about this. This is a big open question in prehistory, is the origins and spread of daring across Europe. We thought we completely understood it until about 2007 when some new research came out and suggested that it's much more complex than we ever thought. And so we're now applying this technology to try to go back further into this Neolithic Bronze Age transition to understand the origins and spread of daring in Europe. Some of our finds, what's really exciting because this is a sequence-based approach as opposed to previous ways of looking at this, trying to get at it through kind of non-specific lipids, because it's a sequence-based approach, um, we can actually distinguish species. So we're able to show that during the Bronze Age, um, the uh, Italian herders in the, the in the Southern Alps um, really favored goat milk, whereas during the Roman times in, um, in Britain, we see uh, sheep and cattle milk. And so far, we've only found cattle milk in Scandinavia. So to pardon the pun, I think we've only scratched the surface of what we can do with ancient microbiome research. But I, it's really exciting, and I'm, I'm particularly excited about the calculus research. Um, because it is found, um, it's so ubiquitous in modern populations. We have a lot of material to study. Um, it's found in, in every known archaeological human population. It's even found in Neanderthals. We find it in hominins. Um, it's, this is chimpanzees. It, you might be surprised to learn chimpanzees make a lot of calculus. Um, and we even find it in some, some animals. This is a little, a little bit of calculus right here on a, on a sheep tooth. And especially for more recent time periods, so say post-Neolithic, we find it in very large quantities. Um, it's not uncommon to pull off as much as 100 milligrams from a single tooth. And in some dentitions, I've cleaned off more than a gram of calculus from the dentition. So it is, in some ways, an abundant resource. So I think the future of ancient microbiome studies is incredibly bright, and we are really only in the earliest stages of beginning to explore the biological, the cultural, and ecological questions we can address through the biomolecular analysis of ancient microbiomes. And dental calculus in particular is proving to be a remarkable lens through which we can begin to reconstruct our ancient microbial self. Thank you. And I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators. Can I follow up on sure. your question? The comment that you made about what the plaque <coughs> looks like, that some are more diffuse and some are more compact. Yeah. In grad school, I worked with a dentist at Indiana University, Indiana University, and he was doing work with the types of sugars that people eat and how it changes the biofilm mm -hmm. and the porosity of plaque. Interesting. So sucrose is supposed to make it more diffuse and so I don't know if maybe if you're able to track what you think people might have been eating and if some are eating like when sucrose was introduced to the diet more heavily um, if you see those more fluffy plaques versus um, the more dense ones where they're eating sugars in different 
disaccharide forms like fruit sugars? Yeah, that's a great question. So certainly sucrose is going to promote the growth of something like streptococcus mutants, which produces a lot of acid, which dissolves the calculus. So sometimes they have these antagonistic roles. So that might be something interesting to look at. Um, we do have a lot of samples from um, Britain in the 1850s with like horrible dental health. So I might be able to address some of those questions. That's right when that's when tea gets introduced, right? And they're sugaring it incredibly at incredibly high levels. Um, so I think that's that's a really interesting question. I should say we do pick up streptococcus mutants in here, which is the leading cause or thought to be one of the leading causes of dental caries overgrowth of this. It's an extreme lactic acid producer, which just produces lots of lactic acid. Um, and it, it has sucrose as its primary substrate of uh, food uh, nutrient. So um, we do find it, um, but a lot of the populations <coughs> I've been looking at are populations that really predate the introduction of refined sugar. So I am really interested in looking at that question, but it's a great hypothesis and task. It's a really good idea. Yeah? I guess this is a bit more medical than evolutionary. But this is medicine than evolution. So, um, <laughs> so in the, oh, it looks like there's a lot of microbes in calculus. Yeah, yeah, they're almost so, side, I mean, they're almost solid. Is it true that the microbes in the ancient calculus are dead? Oh, that's a great question. Um, okay, so we can kind of, we can sort of analyze that. Yes, I, I think that they are all dead. And then the, 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 um, the living people, how many are alive and how many are dead? Um, I think they're mostly dead too. Because that calcification process, the way it works, sorry, I'm just trying to, maybe I'll just do this a bit faster. Let me show the, the image. <coughs> Mm. Um, when so the way that the, cal the calcification happens kind of catastrophically. Um, okay, so um, so it happens kind of it happens very rapidly and catastrophically. And what we see is what was thought to happen. And I didn't mention this, but it is a really cool part of this biology. So um, biofilms are kind of like going into Alice in Wonderland's like through the looking glass. So they use DNA in a really interesting way. They use DNA as a structural molecule. So a number of bacteria, when in biofilms, will actually either secrete DNA into the extracellular matrix or will selectively kill a portion of the, the colony and then stretch out its DNA and use it to orient itself in three-dimensional space as a structural molecule. And um, neutrophils, <laughs> who attack calculus, they actually have a specialized form of cell death called natosis in which they actually hook those granules onto the, the chromatin, and then they burst, and it spreads out like a net, that's why it's called netosis, neutrophil extracellular trap osis, and they actually, it's a way of like throwing a whole bunch of like bombs onto the calculus front, because they, otherwise you can't phagocytize them, they're just a wall. And so in both cases, DNA is a structural molecule, and it's thought that this DNA is a site of nucleation for mineral precipitation. So something happens where the minerals start to precipitate on this extracellular DNA, and it fills in this matrix. And nutrients and liquids can no longer pass through, and so you get localized cell death. And then some of these, like for example, this cell right here is very white. I don't know if you can see it, it's kind of small. Um, it's fully mineralized. The interior of the cell is completely mineralized. And so what happens is their calcium pumps uh, no longer work, their ion pumps fail, and um, they just calcify from the inside out. So you have calcification from the outside in and from the inside out. But you also notice we do have occasionally bacteria um, in completely fully mineralized matrix um, that are not calcified. I think they're dead, but um, they're not calcified. I don't know if I answered your question at all. But in, in, like in me, like if I didn't go to Perry Downs often enough, um, how many back? Do you think they're actually dead? In, in, in the calcified portion, but you have a living, the plaque on the surface yeah, is definitely alive, but the interior calcified portions are dead. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm interested in the genus of Trypanoma. Trip yeah, sure. I think that you found it uh, in the calculus, but in the previous slides, you also found it in the, in the stool, like the uh, materials. Oh, no, like I, I think that was a different one. Let's see. Oh, Trypanoma. Sorry, yes, I was thinking Tanarella. Yes, they, yes. So, we do, so that genus of bacteria is found in both the oral oh, cavity okay. and the gut. Okay. Um, the, there's about 40 species of treponema in the oral cavity. One of them is treponema denticola, which is implicated in periodontal disease. Most of them are commensals, and they are not related to the ones in the gut. In okay, fact, right, right. they are deeply, deeply diverged. So the gut treponemes are actually more closely related to the gut treponemes in, um, in uh, termites than they are to the oral treponemes in the same person's mouth. That's how diverged they are. So it's not the oral cavity seeding it. So do you think that the oral bacteria cannot be a building blocks for the gut bacteria? I don't think that they're a source. I mean, like I said, we swallow 80 billion bacteria in our saliva every day, and some of that is treponine. We do find some treponine 
DNA in saliva. Not a lot because they're strict anaerobes. They type, they like to burrow deep in plaque. They don't. They're not really at the surface. Um, but troponemes are, in general, they're spirochetes. They're they're very um, sensitive to everything. They're very hard to grow. I think they probably just die in the acid environment of the stomach to a large extent, unless they were deeply buried in some sort of food substrate and could make it down. I think it's just they don't really get there in a, in a live state. Yeah. In the calculus, do you find human cells as well besides the bacterial cells? We, we've not seen any human cells. We do find human DNA, and I think the majority of it is actually from that netosis I was talking about. I think it's dead, de dead cell DNA coming in, um, because that's really consistent with all that secretory neutrophil protein that we see as well. So I think primarily most of the human DNA that we find in there is from this process of netosis, this immunological reaction. We haven't seen anything that looks like a human cell, although we do have yeast cells. Um, we don't yet know what kind of yeast. It's very likely candida, because that's very common in the oral cavity. But um, the morphology is a little bit unusual, so I'm analyzing it right now, because I am desperately hopeful that it might be brewer's yeast or baker's yeast, because that would be so exciting. But I think it's probably candida. All right, with that, I would like to thank our speaker.